right, friends. Well, then let us um, center our hearts and minds and enter into worship. Here we go. perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join in singing When the Gifts of God Surprise Us. Yeah. 
The first reading is from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. not 
in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. church sins against you. Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen, even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. All right, my young friends, let's see. I was thinking about this, about the lesson from Romans that we heard. And I have a question for you, Levi. Do you like to dress up in costume? Do you like to dress up in costumes, like for Halloween and stuff? Yeah. I think yeah. most kids do, right? <laughs> it's fun, right? And some adults really like to dress up in costumes, too. And so when you put on a costume or a mask, sometimes you act like the character that you're dressed as, don't you? Right? So if I put on my friendly lion mask, Maybe I act like a friendly lion. Grrr, rawr, 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 but I'm kind of a friendly lion, right? <laughs> or if I um, dress up and I take toilet paper and I wrap it all over me and I become a what? Mummy. A mummy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although toilet paper is pretty pricey and, and uh, scarce these days, so we probably wouldn't do that. But um, but that's the, that's kind of a traditional thing to do. Then you then you have like a mummy, and you do your best mummy imitation, right? So a long time ago, there was a man named Paul who wrote a letter to the followers of Jesus in a place called Rome, in a city. And Paul is trying to teach them how to live in God's way. And he said something that sounds kind of strange to us. He said, you should put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we put on clothes and we might put on a mask or a costume, but what does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? You can't wear Jesus in the way that you wear clothing or a costume. I think what Paul was talking about was um, that on the inside and on the outside, the people of God, that's you and me, um, should look like Jesus. 
Mm. Does that make sense? So when we get up in the morning, what do you think about this? Um, you know, Jesus was kind and loving. So when we get up and we put on our clothes, what if we would to say a little prayer when we're getting dressed and we ask God to help us put on Christ, both in our hearts and um, and um, in our in everything that we do, um, both inward and outward, so that when people look at us, then they see um, that we uh, love Jesus and that we are living in His way. What do you think about that idea, Levi? You think that's a good idea? We put on Jesus and, and, and try to be like him. Um, and I was thinking about that, that that would be a good way to start the day, that we could um, practice loving our neighbor as ourselves and just get ourselves prepared for that. Um, and you know what? I, and when I was yesterday, when I was kind of creating this little mask here, um, I was thinking about a lot of us are wearing masks like this right now, aren't we? And I think that that this is a way, of, and we don't like it really, it's not comfortable, but it's a way of saying, I love you to our neighbor right now, especially to people who are vulnerable, people who um, already have other sicknesses um, and maybe and the virus is really, really dangerous for them. So wearing a mask is a way of loving your neighbor. And I think that's a helpful way to look at it. Um, and so we do whatever we can to care for other people because that's what Jesus does and that's what he wants us to do. Will you pray with me? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus with us. Help us to love others and to see Jesus in them and help us to see Jesus in us. Help others to see Jesus in us. Keep us from fear, keep us hopeful, and make us helpful. Give us peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in the 25 years or so that I've been um, serving an ordained ministry, I've walked with a lot of families at the end of a loved one's life. And um, there have been too many times, I think, when that I've listened to a family member who was already in the throes of grief, express still more grief over a long-standing rift or an old hurt or a grudge that just won't go away. And as I've pondered this, it seems to me that just about every family and every congregation I've encountered bears the scars of this kind of unforgiven sin and when I use the word sin, I'm talking about the things that cause our relationships to become broken. Because breaking relationship is the meaning of the Greek New Testament word hamartia, which is the word most commonly used to um, speak about sin. So most of us, I think, in our daily life tend to put up a pretty good facade and you have to dig deep to find evidence of our woundedness, but it's there. It's there for all of us, even in the healthiest families and in the strongest congregations. In fact, for some of us, the wounds of unresolved wrongs are still raw and festering, even though many years may have gone by. Sometimes we act like wounded animals because we are so hurt. And we keep our hurts, our own hurts alive by lashing out at others. We don't do this intentionally, but that's what happens. And we lash out and we end up hurting others who are innocent bystanders to our own conflict. And every time we lash out, friends, not only do we hurt others, but we also tear open our own wounds again. And sometimes we make those wounds worse by rubbing still more unkind thoughts and hurtful words into them, like a kind, so it's kind of an infection. 
And friends, those are the wounds that fester deep in our souls and eventually end up polluting our whole being. They are the wounds that occupy and erode our hearts and minds. They take up sacred space and they sap energy from us that could be devoted to other more constructive things. Things like, well, loving our neighbor. And we could do these things if only, if only we could be set free. Well, the good news for today is that you and I can be set free from bondage to this cycle of brokenness. And our gospel lesson for today shows us that God not only loves and forgives us as individuals, God cares deeply about our human relationships. God cares how you and I treat our neighbors and God cares how you and I are treated by our neighbors. Jesus, who founded his church on the faith of imperfect people like Peter, and who entrusted the church to imperfect people like you and me, Jesus was well aware that there would be conflicts among his followers. That's just the nature of human community. And the church is no different from the rest of the world. And if we ever forget, a, get, forget that, then we're in big trouble. The church is no better. We are, our, our name should be Miss Forgiven Sinner as the church. That's who we are. As Paul reminds us in his letter to the church in Rome, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To say it another way, every one of us ends up putting our own wants and needs ahead of other people's wants and needs. And this inevitably causes conflict and it causes hurt in our relationships with others. Just spend five minutes, friends, on Facebook or other social media, and I think you'll see what I'm talking about. I think it's, it's definitely getting worse. In, in, in these next 60 days, it's, it's going to get worse. And people who I know to be deeply good people are saying things that are quite appalling and hurtful. We need prayers for that. Again, Jesus knows his followers will experience broken relationships, friends. He knows that about us. He knows that this will happen in our families and that it will happen within our church. And he also understands that rifts with our sisters and brothers in Christ are particularly painful because we have such high expectations of each other in the church, don't we? I know there have been a few times when I personally have been shocked and really hurt by the behavior of another church member toward others or toward me. And I've also witnessed the destructive power of unresolved conflict playing itself out, not just on an individual level, but also in a group setting. For example, 14 years ago, when I was serving as the interim pastor at a small congregation, it very quickly became apparent to me that there were factions among the leadership and some on the council had fallen into the, uh, the bad habit of talking about the church secretary and other church members behind their backs. Um, so at the next church council meeting, um, we had a conversation about that. Guess what we used for, to guide our conversation? Matthew 18 <laughs> verses 15 through 20. Um, surprise, surprise, right? And though anyway, after reading that passage and praying for God's guidance and healing, the council established a new rule. From that point on, we would talk to each other and not about other people who weren't there to defend themselves. Well, a week or so later, I was surprised to learn that two couples had left the congregation and begun worshiping elsewhere. Sadly, it seemed that they preferred to run away from the problem rather than confronting it. But on a more positive note, the majority of the folks who stayed really did make an effort to try to follow Jesus' call to hold each other accountable with courage and care. And for a while, things got better. 
And yet a few years later, I was saddened to learn that the congregation had become so infected by unresolved conflict that it had succeeded in ripping itself apart and it was forced to close its doors. Yet in the final analysis, there, there was some healing that did come out of the process of closing. In the end, there were a few people in the leadership who were able to acknowledge the depth of their own brokenness. And when they did that, they were able to see that the only way to find healing was to dissolve the congregation and give its assets to the wider church's mission and ministry. Now that, my friends, is an example of God's resurrection power bringing new life out of death, using those assets that were left for good, for the, to, prom to promote the good through Christ's church. I wonder how many of you have experienced the pain of having a sister or brother in the church treat you in a, in a hurtful manner. Um, don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you in details, but just thumbs up if you've had that experience. Yeah, I think many of us have. Now, how many of you have been in a congregation where people kept tearing at each other until the entire fabric of the community started to come unraveled. Yeah, a few of you. Um, I think we, we talked about this in our Bible study a couple weeks ago, so I know some of you know well what I'm talking about and how painful it is. Well, my friends, like you and I, Jesus is well aware of how incredibly painful such conflict is among God's people. And he knows how essential it is for us to forgive each other so that we can come together and join in his work of loving and healing the world. And that's why he gives his disciples some very practical guidelines to help us navigate our way through the rough patches of life together in Christian community. After all, you and I need to get our own house in order, don't we, before we can do credible ministry in reaching out to the wider community. But just so that there's no misunderstanding, I want to quote um, Lutheran pastor and, and scholar David Lose. Um, he has a, a wonderful reminder to us. He says, remember that today's gospel lesson is not, quote, a divine recipe for dealing with troublesome Christians, unquote. According to Dr. Lowe's, the primary goal of Jesus' guidelines is not, quote, to change someone's behavior, to demonstrate how he or she is wrong, or even to invite him or her to repentance. Rather, the goal is to restore a damaged relationship by speaking truthfully about the breach or hurt you are experiencing, by taking responsibility for your feelings and your actions, and inviting the other person to do the same, and by inviting dialogue and conversation so that you might find a way forward together." Unquote. Hmm, does this remind anybody else of Zor's covenants for community building? <laughs> Not a coincidence, by the way. So here's an amazing thing, my friends. The 2,000-year-old wisdom of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18 has stood the test of time. In addition to Zor's covenants, even today the steps Jesus outlines are written into church constitutions everywhere as a way of resolving congregational conflict. I think also, many modern psychotherapists would, also, would, would, would agree that Jesus' three-step program offers a healthy approach to conflict resolution in just about any situation. So let's quickly review the steps Jesus lays out again. Step one, if it's safe for you to do so, speak directly with the one who's offended you and let that person know how you feel. In some cases, the other person may not even know that they've hurt you. 
In addition, try to listen to the other person's perspective and work toward healing. Step two, if your sister or brother won't listen to you, take one or two witnesses with you to help mediate the conflict and vouch for your good faith effort. Step three, if your sister or brother still refuses to acknowledge the problem, inform your church leaders and then let go of trying to heal a relationship and give it to God. Jesus puts it this way, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Well, what does that mean exactly? We asked the good Lutheran question, right? What does this mean? When we consider that Jesus himself healed Gentiles and ate with tax collectors, I think we can only conclude that we should still care about those persons, even if they're no longer considered members of our church community. So to sum up then, the steps Jesus outlines aren't easy. Even he acknowledges that our best efforts won't always bring healing. And yet on those occasions when we do reach genuine reconciliation with our sisters and brothers, the peace and freedom we experience assures us that our efforts were more than worth it. Now, in the almost three years that I've served here at Zor, I'm sure that I've offended some members here. In part, that's the reality of being human and the reality of engaging in the challenges of ministry in community. As a wise colleague once said, no matter what you do, not everyone is going to like you. Or to quote a meme that some of my colleagues have shared, um, if you want people to like you, don't be a pastor, go sell ice cream. <laughs> so so I, I'm laughing, but it's also, I'm also serious too at the same time. Um, now that I know, again, seriously, on a serious note, there may be some that I've offended among you and I may not even be aware of it. And so I'm gonna propose something risky because things that are worthwhile, relationships are always risky and they take hard work. So if I've offended anyone, any of you, I'd like to ask your forgiveness. And I invite you to enter into mutual conversation with me about it because in order to grow in my faith, I need to be aware of where I've fallen short. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna change my stance on a particular matter. It simply means that I'll do my best to listen to you and to listen for the reconciling spirit of our Lord Jesus, who promises to be present with us when we gather in his name. Now, in a similar vein, for the sake of the gospel, I invite each of you to think about your own life. Do you have an unresolved conflict with someone? Or is there someone who has hurt you, who needs your forgiveness? Is there someone you've hurt who needs to hear your, hear your acknowledgement and your apology. If so, then I urge you to take Jesus' words to heart and follow the steps that he outlines. It'll change your life, friends, in the best possible way, because that's what the gospel does. I've, I've heard stories over the years um, from church members who've um, shared that this passage from Matthew 18 has moved them to reconcile um, a long-standing rift with someone else. And when I hear those stories shared, I just say, wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. And so my friends, our God has important work for us to do. The urgent work of loving and healing this beautiful yet broken world. And in this age of great uncertainty, of deep division and pain, I think all of us are acutely aware there's no time to waste on things that hold us back and tear us apart. Things like lingering grudges and unresolved conflicts and old wounds that continue to fester. Today, you and I 
are being showered with the healing power of God's forgiveness, which comes to us as a free gift in word and sacrament. And as we go out into the world each day, Christ calls us to offer that same refreshing gift of forgiveness to others because our life and the life of the world depends on God's forgiveness and reconciliation through Christ. As South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu has so wisely said, without forgiveness, we have no future. Amen. Let's join in singing our hymn, Lord of all nations, grant me grace. Sustain us in our work, O God, and give work to those who need it. 
shape societies to ensure fair treatment for all who labor. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Renew and enliven places suffering from fire, drought, flood, storms, or pollution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, today we lift up to you um, Mark's friend Marlon, and we give thanks for the successful surgery and ask that you would continue to hold him in your loving care and give him your healing touch as he recovers in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. And Lord, we lift up to you, Jean, as she goes into surgery this week on Wednesday. We ask that you would guide the hands of her surgeons, give them your wisdom and your compassion, hold her in your loving care, give her your peace, and bring healing to her body. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We remember, Lord, with thanksgiving, those who have died in faith. As you equipped them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation. And today we especially remember Butch Spaulding, and we lift up his family and ask you to hold Joanne and the rest of the family in your loving care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. All these things, and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. One, two, three. May the peace of Christ be with you always. Oh, great. This is our time to ponder what we can offer back in thanksgiving to God for all that God has first given us. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, holy God, mighty and immortal, through Christ our Lord. Who on this day broke the bonds of death, opening to us the way of everlasting life and giving us a foretaste of the feast to come. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. satisfied by your abundance. 
You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your Spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want. And by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet table, where Christ gives himself as food and drink. We are going to join in singing, uh, now we join in celebration.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.